If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I was meeting with a group of pastors on Tuesday, and we were talking about the times and the seasons, and where the next challenge will be for the church. And uh, we were trying to discuss a little bit, do you think, I, I asked the question, is it easier to serve the Lord in prosperity or adversity? You know, when things are going, you know, sometimes I call out to the Lord, not so much in prosperity, but in the adversity, you know. And in some nations, uh, there is a great uh, persecution. And uh, mostly our nation hasn't seen so much of that. Although in some countries, you're forbidden to preach the whole gospel or you get jailed. And, you know, in fact, one nation, I, I'm thinking it might be... Well, I'll, I won't say the name, but in one country, uh, they don't think too much of you if you haven't been jailed at least one time for your faith. <laughs> Man, hasn't happened yet. But yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of happy for that, but, you know, that, that's, it's a way of life to them. You know, we think about uh, persecution coming in the end times, and these folks say, in that case, we're there. We're, we get persecuted all the time. And, and as a, our nation, we have, we have a relative amount of freedom to preach the gospel. I think that sometime uh, with the economic situations, I would not be surprised if the nation wanted to tax the church. They, sent, they send subtle innuendos to us. Your property has been evaluated at X amount of dollars. <laughs> you know, why you send this to me? Because we don't pay taxes. Well, they just want you to know, like I care. Now, you're the, I don't own the property, but uh, they sort of just send a little gentle hint that uh, if you're going to be taxed, this is going to be the amount. Uh, would that be really persecution? It would be a pain in the neck, I'll tell you that, and a pain in the wallet. But... I don't know that necessarily I would consider that terrible persecution, and certainly we would fight it like every other church in America. I think they would be, uh, it would be a losing, who knows, though, the way our Constitution gets revamped or interpreted, we don't know. Is ours going to be that kind of persecution? Is it a, sometimes persecution is stuff that you can't see. It's sort of subtle. It, it's that uh, overriding... Uh, attitude. I don't know. And uh, so as we read here, keep in mind what Peter is writing to a group of people that were under foreign uh, leadership, dictatorial leadership. Christians were in the major minority and they were looked down. They were considered a subsect of Judaism. And even today, I, I was uh, this week. I talked to a friend of mine who had been in Turkey, and he was teaching football and giving the gospel, <laughs> teaching American football, uh, because he had coached and things, and and then uh, sharing the gospel and leading people to the Lord. And he says, in that country, uh, sometimes people do not want to say, "Well, I became a Christian," because that meant that you were no longer Turkish. You were no longer a citizen. You became a Christian, a Christ follower. Uh, sometimes that mentality escapes me. I, I don't totally... Con I understand what they're saying. I just don't understand why. So here's Peter in a really difficult place. People are losing their jobs. They're getting thrown out of their homes. Just because the name of Christ, uh, Christ uh, they, they claim him as their savior. That's pretty uh, intense kind of persecution that has not come to our shores and I hope never does. First Peter chapter 3, we're going to begin verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, can I just stop there? 
sometimes I suffer for stupidity's sake, <laughs> has nothing to do with righteousness. You know, the Bible says, you came and you visited me in prison. That was a spiritual thing. And some people say, well, I went to see people in prison. They were suffering for righteousness. People are in prison for doing wrong, being unrighteous. I'm not saying we shouldn't visit them. Let's just use the, the scripture in context, okay? So if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify, set him apart, sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. That's a, that's a good thing. We better understand, if you're going to suffer, you at least want to know why. Having a good conscience, and I'm going to add toward God, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins and just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So the, Peter is now saying, here's an illustration. Jesus suffered. Guess what? You might suffer for doing right, but you're in good company. Doesn't make the suffering any less, but at least if you have a purpose. And they said, by which you also went and preached unto them the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few there is eight souls were saved by fire. I do not believe that Jesus goes to hell and gives people a second chance. But the people were given an opportunity while Noah was building the ark and they refused it. And they were reminded of that later, their rejection of the gospel, or at least at that time, to, you know, to get onto the ark. The like figure whereto, and even baptism also does now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Let's keep going. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, can I add, an attitude, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You and I are controlled by the will of God. We are, we are doing what he wants when we are righteous in this world. We realize that not everybody is going to be liking our righteousness. There are some nations in this world that you and I would be jailed almost immediately. If I've had some friends who have been deported from countries because they shared the gospel. Thrown out. A valued member of society just pitched right out. Who had to move in their missions work. There are some places where people are severely persecuted and beaten, and we know that to be the case. This year, and I want, I'm just drawing this figure, but in the neighborhood of 100,000 people will be martyred. That's more than most of the football stadiums can hold in one year. Just imagine everybody you know from Carlisle to Shippensburg and maybe down toward Chains was just wiped off the face of the earth. If you put it all in one spot maybe including Harrisburg. That's a lot. And every soul is precious in the sight of the Lord, martyred for their faith. Fox's book of Martyrs uh, records some of those things. But I am told that more people died in probably the last 80 to 90 years than all of time beforehand. Of course, we have more people. Peter says, when we do these things, we're, we're identifying with the Lord. I don't know if it's ever going to come to that. I hope it never does, but it may. And uh, maybe I'll ask us this question. Have we suffered because we're Christians? Have we suffered? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we realize that 
we have an adversary who would rob and kill and destroy us. We have people like Peter who were persecuted and John who they tried to boil in oil and eventually Peter is executed and crucified upside down. But he writes to us that we should identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I, help, I ask that you'd help us. Not a one of us can say what exactly we would do. But we pray for your grace in the time of need. That ever, whatever we go through and whatever we need at that time, that your grace will be sufficient for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We really can't say what we actually do in time. I mean, I'd like to say in every situation I would do this. I, you know... Uh, Sometimes you get into the middle of a situation and you, don't, you can't see the whole picture. But we need wisdom from the Lord. Uh, in our society, uh, I believe that uh, political correctness is a type of persecution. I am not saying that people ought to be raw and raucous, but sometimes uh, in our society, and I'll just make some strong statements, I am totally not in favor of same-sex marriage. Uh, you know, but I know in some nations it would be illegal for me to preach that. Like Canada, where you can be jailed, do some jail time. I would most gladly say, do that. Uh, I do not care if they make it legal or not. It is still morally wrong. And just because something is legal, they can legalize things in our society to placate a majority that still doesn't make it right in the eyes of God. So this is one of those times where I would join the, the disciples and say, we ought to obey God rather than man. And it's not as an uppity kind of thing. It's not like I'm going to be arrogant and uh, my way or else. It's that we humbly serve the Lord. I think people who suffer are not usually the people who have uh, hunger protests and they're trying to make a cause about, a, you know, hugging a tree. and st I don't call that persecution. I call that ignorance. But there are people that bring on persecution by their very behavior. They do a demonstration, so they hope they make a point. I don't think any believer is out to make a point. They are out to serve the Lord. There's a difference. Because they are not an aberration in time. You ought to see a lifestyle, a consistency in that person before the event and after the event. And so it shouldn't be just a Johnny-come-lately thought or, or something that would uh, cause to take a popular stand. It's based upon the Word of God. And respectfully, you know, I think that the disciples, you never see them, hey, let's fight and get out of this. Peter and John were in the jail willingly, uh, you know, and, and God delivered them. But sometimes they were beaten and they counted it. They, were, they said, wow, we are counted worthy. They noticed the Lord in our life. They were consistent. Peter gets, I remember when Peter gets out of jail and Rhoda answers the door <laughs> and she shuts the door. She's so excited at the prayer meeting and Peter's, I just, that's one of those funny passages. I think, and Peter's standing like, could you let me in? She got so, remember that story? Okay. Anyhow, so uh, Jesus uh, wants us to be consistent. Now, the guy who's writing this, Peter had been persecuted by the high priest and by the Sadducees. In Acts chapter 5, he's one of the guys, you know, the silver and gold have a none, and, and they're but don't talk in Jesus' name, and they're getting up his nose, and he said, we've got to obey God rather than man. Uh, later on, King Herod, you remember King Herod had uh, beheaded James, but he captured Philip. And in Acts chapter 12, he was going to do the same thing to Peter. Should I say Philip? I meant Peter. He, he captures Peter, and he's going to do him in just like he did James. You know, it's interesting. 
I'm glad that not everything happens the same way twice. And Peter gets out, and the other man dies. But Peter wanted to encourage us to be faithful even unto death. So what's the worst thing they can do to us? Johnny Jernigan, one of our evangelists, talked to the youth at a youth convention, and he said, you know, you need to be a bold witness for Christ and uh, about aggressive evangelism. And he says, if, if they beat us up, God will heal us. If they kill us, we'll be with God. <laughs> you know, he had, he, that was his mantra that weekend. You know, you have nothing to fear. And uh, we don't. So it is possible that you and I will suffer undeservedly. Uh, when you read the word suffering in the New Testament, there are, it happens 53 times, but a, a majority, 16 times in 1 Peter alone does he say, you know, there might be suffering connected to your walk. Guess what this guy is measuring in on? Now, the reason we're going through Peter is there's, there's a lot of similarities in Peter's life and, and ours or his time. And his whole walk was based on, on the Lord's faithfulness working through him. And he said, you know what? If you're going to suffer, let's make this significant and meaningful. Let's make this significant and meaningful. And you say, wait a minute. You know, it, it, isn't it terrible to have suffered for nothing? But we are, if we suffer, we will suffer for something. Something is a cause, the cause of Christ. So I want to just skip on here, grab a couple things. He says, one of the things about we might suffer, it says, if you be followers of that which is good. It's in verse 13. You know, he, if you're followers, Jesus says to his disciples, you know what, if they hate me, you're going to hate you. you know, take up your cross, follow me. You know, I will work in you, but just mark it down. You might suffer. I'm always glad when I don't, but you know, it's a possibility. Uh, serving the Lord is no guarantee that we won't go through a hard thing. But serving the Lord means that he will walk with us through the hard place. So if you be followers, which is good. If, and then another one here says in verse 14, if you suffer for righteousness' sake. The whole theme of the book of Job is why do the innocents suffer? And Job, that as far as we know, is the oldest writing known to man. And the question is, Job who eschewed evil and did nothing wrong. He suffered. And he has these bold statements, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you're going, this guy's got to be superhuman. No, he had to walk with God. He realized, you know, that the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. You know, sometimes I don't like it when he takes stuff away. I think the devil takes a lot away. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father in heaven, which whom there is no variables nor shadow of turning. I, I'm going to the, I'm camping out in the scripture. I like the good parts. Job makes these statements like, yet though he slay me, I will serve him. You know, it, 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 and it's not like he's saying these things in a vacuum. He's saying he's under tremendous stress and pressure. Why is it that innocent people suffer? I, if you, you know, uh, there, there are all kinds of answers to that. I don't think any of us are ever going to be immune from suffering in some way, some fashion. Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, he talks in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and save all manner of evil things against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. He takes us out of this life and shows us what's eternally true. And he says, you know, I want you to know something. This life is not all there is. Tonight we sang the, the hymn, We Shall See the King. Everyone who has this hope, we looked in 1 John, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. You know, you get that energy, that strength from the Lord. 
Sometimes uh, when believers face suffering and persecution because they're Christians, we, I, need to realize, hey, this is a good thing. I'm getting identified with Christ. I don't always come to that realization at the beginning, but you know what? If you get identified as being, yeah, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but uh, I have been called the choir boy, goody two-shoes, preacher boy. I, I've had a lot of slings. You know what? You're not going out and getting drunk with us. Yeah, and I'll remember what I did last night, but will you? I, I'm not going to wake up getting beat up, but you will. You will, you, you know, if you read the Proverbs, that guy gets up in the morning and he says, man, I don't know what happened to me, but I've got bruises I can't explain. You know, I don't have to worry about those guys. You know, I'm set free from a lot of con uh, concerns this world has. Did I drink and drive? Robin was driving her school bus one time and this, this girl pulled out in front of her and she called her boss immediately and she, she didn't hit the car. It's just there was no way to, to avoid it. Her boss says, you might have to have a drug test and she goes, I have to tell you I have Coke in my system. And he says, really? She says, yeah, Diet Coke. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't humored. <laughs> it was a serious event, but no one was injured and, and, you know, and the girl was at fault. But, you know, sometimes if we can, even in adversity, realize we didn't do anything wrong. That's, you know what, sometimes blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake. Some people just don't like Christians. When I was doing some graduate work, I had a different opinion about a lot of things because I think I really was the only active Christian in the, the clan there. And so I saw things way different than they did. <clears throat> and needless to say, that some of them were not really happy with me. But I could give an answer for the hope that lies within me. I could tell them why I thought what I did. I wasn't trying to be offensive. By the way, being persecuted for Christ's sake, probably not one of the good prophets were not persecuted. People who were the spokesmen for God. Be not afraid of the terrors. In verse 14, be not afraid, neither be troubled. You know, why, why should we not be afraid? I will fear no evil for... Yeah. Boy, if we can just remember that. I mean, we know that, but I mean, to experience that. God is our protector. Does that mean that everything is going to go my way? Maybe not. But when I know down in my heart that I've done it right, and you know down in your heart that you have done the right thing, and the other person has it, you know, the persecutor or whoever it is, has it wrong, eh, eh, that's on them. Someday you and I will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we will give an accounting for our action. And I just want to say, well done. You did a good job. Be not afraid of their terror. You know, by the way, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the angry God. You know, that's the one you want. Don't fear the one who can kill your body. Fear the one who can kill your soul. You know, so there is a possibility that you and I might suffer undeservedly. That's just a plain vanilla fact. How do we get ready for that kind of stuff? I mean, if you're going to play football, you have training and you're doing all of the whatever you got to do to get there and you're learning the plays. And, you know, how do we spiritually prepare for what's coming ahead? Here it's going to tell us what to do. Verse 15, sanctify the Lord. Uh, one place says, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. You need to let him have priority in your life. If we are Christians and we will suffer for Christ's sake, we better be doing it right. And we need to bow down to him in reverence and submission. We need to call on him. And uh, you know what? When you and I fear the Lord, other people will fear the Lord. That's all it is. They're going to pick up our attitude. And so he says, sanctify, set apart the Lord in your life. 
let him, uh, you know, verse 15, right after it, be ready always to give an answer to every man that answer, uh, asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you. You know, uh, be ready to defend yourself. Now, here's the thing. You are never going to talk someone into the kingdom. And, you, you know, some people who are unreasonable, you can talk to your blue in the face and their blue in the face and they still don't get it. And how does an unspiritual mind comprehend spiritual things? It doesn't go together. But you know what? We need to, we need to make a proper defense. And there's nothing wrong with defending yourself in this respect. You know, Peter remembers a time you know, when uh, maybe he didn't give a proper defense. You know, his little girl says, uh, aren't you one of us? No, no, and he swears, remember, around the fire? He didn't have the right answer. He weaned out to a little kid. He says, you know what? We should be able to, to declare to anyone of our walk with the Lord and his faithfulness to us. Then it says in here, verse 16, having a good conscience. May I say that the, the Holy Spirit works in our conscience he convicts us concerning sin of unrighteousness. He points us to the Savior. But there are some people who mistake the Holy Spirit for our conscience. That's not true. He is outside of our being. He prompts us. He has an input into us. But there are some people who have no conscience. They have seared their conscience. They have burned it. They have continued it on wrong and they are not listening to the voice of God. They have hardened their heart, the King James says. They, they are not responding, you know. And so uh, you and I who, have, you know, who are tender toward the Lord, it ought to bother us when things are out of sorts. It ought to bother us when... Uh, People misunderstand. It ought to bother us because we're tender. We have his mind. We, we want people to come to the Lord. So having a good conscience means that the Holy Spirit is not convincing us if our heart condemns us not, one passage says. You know, if it's not, some people are condemned by everything. Oh, I should have said that. I should have they, they self-condemn. You know, they sort of beat each other up. You know, I mean, they're self up. You don't have to say they just are they repenting for everything. What I'm saying is we have to have boldness to live for the Lord, but we also have a conscience that is tender toward the voice of God, the Holy Spirit. Having a good conscience is worth, you, you lay your head down on the pillow at night and you're not running down every rabbit trail, shoulda, woulda, coulda. You want a good night's sleep, have a good conscience. Have a clear conscience toward the Lord. Confess our sins and, and walk with the Lord. By the way, having a good conscience is not saying that you're perfect because I am always indebted to the Lord. But, you know, having a good conscience, when he prompts me to get it right, I get it right. And then, it says, uh, I'm going to keep reading here. Thanks for the Lord, you aren't giving an answer. Have a good conscience where they speak. And, and for it is better if, now listen to verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. Suffering can be in the will of God? Oh, there are some people that say, oh, you're suffering because you're out of the will of God. Maybe you are suffering in the will of God. Boy, doesn't that counter some of the current teaching of today. You can do everything right and still suffer? Hey, ask the disciples who were obedient to the Lord, get in the boat, or, you know, he's asleep in the boat, and the storm comes up, right? Were they following the Lord? Yeah. Were they obedient to the Lord? Yeah. Were they where he wanted? Yeah. Was he in the boat with them? Yeah. So everything's going good, and they still had a storm. But I thought we shouldn't have storms. Yeah, well, get a real life. Because my God didn't jump out of the boat for them. He got up and calmed the sea. And the, wind, and the waves obeyed him. Sometimes he has to calm my heart. Sometimes when the adversity comes, it, it, it's to do a greater depth of work in my heart. Not just so I'll trust him, 
but to, so I can have the joy of the Lord in any situation. If it be the will of God, some of us may suffer. Well, that's real living. So if it be the will of God in our world, some people are suffering not because they've done wrong, but because they've done right. Huh. And then he gives us some examples in here of people who undeservedly suffered. And, of course, you can't go wrong with Jesus. Verse 18, for Christ has suffered for sins. He, Jesus suffered as an innocent person. He was never evildoer, no sin in him. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might receive the righteousness that only he could provide. Hmm? So there was a... By the way, is there someone on your list that you would willing to go through suffering for that they would come to salvation? Just think about that. Where, you know, my sister-in-law says, I was praying for that my, her sister would come to the Lord and whatever it takes. And she goes, man, I didn't know it would be this close to death. Sometimes we suffer right along with the people who deserve the suffering. And sometimes, I would submit to you, it is always at the cost of the righteous that the unrighteous come to salvation. You're praying, you're giving, you're witnessing, you're going out of your way to be nice to people who are not nice. It costs you something. And it's worth the price for a soul to come to the kingdom. And even people you don't know, it's worth the price. So we may suffer like Christ Peter said, you know, God has divine purposes. Sometimes we don't always comprehend them. Sometimes things don't look right and God is still in charge. Can you trust in the sovereignty of God and a God who is all-knowing and is in control of everything? My answer is yes. You know, I can, I, I'd like to say, like Job, you had to always slay me. I'll go through it. I, I, I don't know. I'm really, I don't. I'm not signing up for suffering. Please don't get the wrong idea. You don't have a super pastor. You have a normal Joe. I just think it like it happens like this. Where grace, where sin did abound, you know, grace, I, I use the word super abounded. It, it overwhelmed it. I think when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard against him. I think when the difficulties come in our lives, that he will supernaturally energize me or you to take that on head on and be the victor in Jesus' name, in his power, in his strength. And, and that doesn't mean that I conquer every foe. Is it, it means that God is somehow going to get glory in the midst of that situation. See, Peter said, when you're going, to, you're going to crucify me, fine. Do it upside down. I'm not worthy to be dying like Christ. History tells us that's what they did. I, if you want some gruesome stuff, look at how all the disciples died. The only one that dies a natural death is, is uh, John the Beloved. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, they boiled him in, his, in oil. He said, man, that was a wonderful skin treatment. Thank you. I don't know if he had skin problems after that. or I'm making a little light of it. As he banished him to an island, he, he lived there by himself. But God, in the midst of that, revealed and said, by the way, John, I want you to see some stuff that's going to yet to come. And some of you can't write down because it's pretty wild. They're never going to believe this, John. Just, I'm letting you know. <laughs> he says, and even sometimes we read the book of Revelation, there are parts of that I just say, wow, I wonder what that means. All I know is that the lamb is victorious. I know that God is, has won. I know the devil is defeated and that I get to go to heaven. That's the part, that's the takeaways for me. 
See, all that are godly will suffer persecution. Later he's going to write. And Peter's going to write. And sometimes I say maybe it would be a good thing to have more persecution. It would drive us closer to the Lord. I'm not signing up for that. But, you know, you think of an example of patience. God was patient with at least 120 years while Noah was building the ark. That's a pretty long time. It's a pretty long time for people to make fun of you. Man, what kind of character this Noah dude had. That he, for 120 years he was maligned and ridiculed and he held fast because of relationship with God. See, the world measures the persecution part and God measures the sustaining part. And then when the pressure comes from the outside, he is creating a peace from the inside that the world can't understand. We, we talk about, you know, the world didn't give it and the world didn't take it away. This peace, this joy, this love that's inside you and I. You know, we can go through anything if God is with us. What it tells us is that God was dependable, he was faithful, and he kept his word to Noah. You keep reading down there, it tells all these things. <sighs> Peter is trying to let you know that sometimes in this life difficulties will come. Suffering in this present life is not worthy to be compared, right? To the joy of the Lord. What a wonderful day that we have to look forward to. What, you know, uh, it will be worth it all, we sometimes sing. But he tells us here at the very end. He says, look at verse chapter 4, verse 1. Some who had the same mind have ceased, no longer should live the rest of the time in the flesh, because it says, for the time, the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of God, uh, the will of the Gentiles, and he goes on all these terrible things. But he ends up by saying, "When it's all said and done, that inherit we get an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, and that fades not away." I tell you what, that's a good place to be. So, if the time comes for suffering. I don't think we have to imagine. I think we just have to say, Lord, give me your grace for now. It's sort of like having a, 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 a car engine with a lot of power. You don't need all that power all the time. But it's there just in case. At just the right time, one of these big trucks with the dualies and the four-wheel drive and all that, it's a waste of gas to run that all the time. But it's really nice if you're stuck in a ditch, when you have to pull something out, when you want to help someone, and you engage all those things. Well, we have a God who is more powerful than any truck, who is actively engaged. And some of these have automatic four-wheel drive. We have a God who knows exactly what we need and he exerts just the right amount of power on our behalf. Let's just sing that chorus and let's bow our heads. Let's thank the Lord. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race 
till we see Christ. That's one reason we sang, we shall see the King. Because there is coming a day, and you know, as you see time unfolding, it's not hard to imagine that can happen today. When you see the controversy, the wars, the rumor of the wars, the Mayan calendar who is ending and people are all world about that, like, I care. Because my God says, we're living in the last days anyhow. Someday, someone's going to predict the end of the earth and they're going to be right. Unfortunately, it wasn't the guy who said uh, that this couple of years, you know, last. But you know what? We live in such a way that the Lord Jesus Christ, the imminent return of the Lord, he could come any time. And we're not afraid of that. We need to work for that. The early church said, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. So tonight before you leave, you need to say Maranatha. Maranatha. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I want you to come. I want to be ready. I want those people in my prayer list to be ready. I want some people who more, you know, I'm not content with just what we got. We need to fill the boat up here. And I believe there's coming a day of revival. I think the Spirit of the Lord is going to pour out on people again. Not arbitrarily, but purposefully. And he's going to use us, his people. And it may bring persecution. Will it be worth it? Oh, yeah. We get to heaven, hot dog. By the way, the one pastor died and went to heaven. And he got a dinky bungalow. They said, why? He says, you know, what's going on? They said, well, we could only build with the material that you send ahead. Didn't send much there. But the little old lady church lived in a palatial estate. Why? Because she lived for the Lord and she sent not her money, although she might have done that, but she was totally dedica dedicated to the Lord and through suffering and pain she served the Lord and henceforth has laid up a treasure incorruptible. Uh, I, I don't understand, you know, where thieves can't break through and steal, where moth and rust does not corrupt, I, all the things that are going on. I want to be that kind of person, don't you? Lord bless you, and live in light of eternity tonight. Amen.